Uh, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've already talked about when is the judgment state of Christ. Let's talk about what it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's also for the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, this morning and this afternoon, Father, uh, just to look into your perfect book and to understand more about you and what you expect from us, Lord. Help us to really get a, a complete understanding of the seriousness of standing before you one day, Lord. And uh, I pray that the souls in here will get busy about making that preparation according to you and according to your perfect will. Lord, just bless the words that come out of my mouth. I pray that they be your words, Father. And I ask that you bless us in, holy, uh, in the name of uh, your Son, our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 If you've got a King James Bible, the words judgment seat of Christ are only going to be in there two times. The verse we're going to look at now in Romans 14.10. If you don't have a King James Bible, chances are they're in there maybe once, maybe not even that. It's just one of the things about the new Bibles that you really, really take away from uh, sound documents. It's hard to find out what God expects from us sometimes. But look here in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, beginning in verse 10. You know what? Um, yeah. For we must all appear, this is Paul writing to believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Verse 11. Therefore, knowing, or knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What's he talking about? What is this terrible thing? Well, Paul said, uh, writing to the church of Philippi, he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right. Now, is he talking about the same thing on your soul? No. Like here, he's talking about knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. It's not about getting people saved. It's about telling saved people, hey, there's something terrifying yeah. awaiting us. But right. we can be prepared. Right. You know, this I hope today for you is a wake-up call mm -hmm. to get prepared. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Look down in verse 1 of the same chapter. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, if you were here this morning, you saw that picture. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You know, you're bought with Christ. That's clay that hasn't been processed. You saw it dissolve. You're going to pour off the water. And that's what's left of that pot. It's just the clay. We know that we have, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. What's that all about? Keep your hand in Corinthians, but turn to the back of your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. What's he talking about? That you could be found naked, unclothed. Revelation 3, uh, we'll begin down in verse 16. This is John, he's writing to the seven churches he's been instructed to. The seventh church he writes to is the Laodicean church. And each one of those seven churches represented a specific, a specific period of years of history. The Laodicean church was the seventh church. It was the last one. It happens to be, that's why we know this is imminent, this judgment seat of Christ. He, this is the message to the Laodicean church, and it's a picture of us at this time in history. Laodicean means people's rights or civil rights. And that's a, a hallmark of our culture. People's rights, self-esteem. That's what all the churches are preaching. Yeah. Uh, not this one, I'm sure. Yeah. Because that's not my mm -hmm. God says, deny thyself. You know, what does a man have that he hasn't received? I hope you agree with me on God's word that we are nothing. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, this is, this is what it should be. You know, sometimes I question whether I'm actually an evangelist. Because I looked up evangelist in the dictionary. It said it's a uh, it's a, someone that travels from spot to spot and preaches, and usually 
at churches and uh, with the uh, attempts at people becoming Christians. Okay? And my ministry isn't to the lost people. It's really, my ministry is to Christians. And in effect, actually, what it is is to make Christians become Christians. Yeah. Because the word Christian, really, it's only used three times in the Bible. Every time it's capitalized. And it means a disciple of Christ. Yeah. But you maybe have seen this before, but I hope it will help remember what a Christian is. Christ plus I am. I am nothing. Mm -hmm. That's what we should have, our mindset. I am nothing, mm -hmm. but with Christ, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. That's what we should have. Not self-esteem. Right. Not it's all about you. You're a good person. Right. Revelation 3, 16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and there's that word, and naked. Mm -hmm. So what does he say? Look at 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Turn back to Corinthians. This time go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I mentioned to you that the judgment seat of Christ is only mentioned two times in the Bible. Once you understand the judgment seat of Christ and its relationship to the second advent, the rapture, and the tribulation, you're going to see the judgment seat of Christ all over your body. And many times, as a, the example right, these verses we're talking about right here, you're going to realize it's exactly what he's talking about. But every time the Bible talks about the second advent, by implication he's saying, well, okay, that's right after the judgment seat of Christ. Every time the Bible talks about the rapture, that's right before the judgment seat of Christ. Every time the Bible talks about the great tribulation, it's all throughout this book, the tribulation. Up in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ. But look here in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 11. Paul, writing to believers again, says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, three valuable things, wood, hay, stubble, three you know, not so valuable things, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. That single word, day, is a specific reference to the judgment seat of Christ. You know that by the context. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try what? Every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. You know the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus Christ, about our Heavenly Father, is the fact that if we do things for him, that are really no more than our reasonable service, that he's going to not only uh, allow us to spend eternity in heaven with him and all the fellow believers that are there, hopefully many of your relatives, yeah. uh, he's going to give us rewards on top of that. That's right. It talks about five crowns in here, and that's not the mm -hmm. point of my message to go into that, but those are definite rewards that we can get on top of it. Look at verse uh, 15. If any man's work shall be burned... That's the wood hay stubble. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. This book is full of pictures. You saw a couple of pictures in the last hour about the vessel of clay that was marred, uh, about the, the, the pitcher that's broken, and that the, you have this treasure in this. Here's a picture here in the Old Testament. A person that is saved, yet so is by fire. That's Abraham's nephew, Lot. As Lot was left with cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord rained down hail and fire and all that and destroyed everything that Lot had. We know from Hebrews chapter 11 that Lot is saved. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope when we get to heaven one day and we meet Lot, that maybe he did a bunch of things that God chose not to put in this book. God did want us to have a picture. He wants us to have pictures of everything, and they're all through this Bible. He wants us to have a picture of a 